Hi, this is Christine again, and I'm going to be your instructor for the second part of Pediatric Boot Camp. The first thing we're going to talk about is pediatric variations of nursing interventions. And we're going to talk about preparing a patient for a procedure with the goal to decrease anxiety, promote cooperation, and support coping skills psychological preparation of the child, age-specific guidelines for preparation based on developmental characteristics, how to establish trust and provide support for that child, parental presence and support, and explanation to the child. Before we go any further, I'd like to tell you what my personal feeling is in dealing with pediatric patients, and that is that you need to, firstly and foremost, get the trust and cooperation of the parent. Because it doesn't matter in the long run how much the child trusts you. If the parent doesn't trust you, you can't do your job. So I take the time to go in and introduce myself to each parent or each caregiver in the room, shake their hands, um, and tell them how long I'm going to be there, that I'm their nurse, ask if they need anything, and then um, even make a little small talk. You know, ask if they live nearby, um, you know, just kind of try to um, establish a little rapport, and then go on to explaining what I need to do for the patient. So I usually start by saying, you know, I try very hard to answer the call bell within three minutes, if you press the call bell and I don't come, um, I would like you to to um, to know that I'll be on my way as soon as I possibly can be. If I, for some reason I come in and I tell you that I'm gonna be back and you don't see me back at the time that you would like that I promised, please press the call bell again. I try very hard to always do what I ask, what I what I promise, but sometimes I do get busy and I forget. Um, and then I go over things like the pulse ox in the room, what the numbers on the screen mean, what the monitor means, why I'm going to be looking at the child's IV site, what the volutrol means, um, why it's important to keep the IV, keep a strict intake and output put record, um, I always go over if they have a crib, how to safely lock the crib, how to contact me if I'm needed, you know, press, this is how you press the call bell, if someone's shown you how to do that, you know, this is the remote for the TV. I never assume that the nurse prior to me has done that. And then if the patient's on oxygen or anything else that's going on, I explain to the parents um, what the flow rate means and all of that. So as I'm checking through that, since you have to check it anyway, you just go through and check it out loud, basically. State what you're doing and why you're doing it. And the parent has so much more confidence and faith in you because they understand why you're doing what you're doing. So it's really important to communicate. And then, if you have to do a procedure for the patient, they're going to right away uh, have a level of trust with you that they maybe didn't have with someone who didn't take the time to explain. So you want to start by just going over what your plan for the day is, what all the equipment is, asking if they need anything, and then and that takes two minutes. Really, it takes two minutes. And then you want to start telling them about what procedures planned for the patient. If I need to start an IV, I always explain why, whether it's because they need antibiotics or they need IV fluids, but I don't just say we need to start an IV because she needs IV fluids. I say Susie needs an IV because it looks like she's a little dehydrated. She doesn't have enough fluid in her bloodstream and when a child gets too dehydrated, it can be serious. So we want to make sure that she doesn't get too sick. And the, re the way we're going to do that is to put this IV in 
and that way we can make sure she's getting enough uh, fluid. And then um, if, you know, it's for antibiotics, we're, I would say we're going to put the IV in for anti so we can give antibiotics. It's to kill a bacteria that we think might be growing in Susie's bloodstream. We're not sure at this point, but we want to want to just be careful and treat it just in case or whatever the reason is. So um, just give them a more in-depth uh, explanation than, well, we need to start IV fluids. You know, if it was your child, you would want more of an explanation. Keep in mind for the child that it's a very scary experience, and it can be scary for the parents as well. There are unknown medical staff approaching children, and are oftentimes these people are wearing masks. And just keep in mind that we are always telling our children, especially like stranger danger, don't talk to people you don't know. And then all of a sudden they're in the hospital and they're supposed to talk to people that they don't know. And these people are wearing crazy clothes and masks over their faces. It's very scary. There's unusual smells in the hospital. It's all a new environment. There's things beeping. Um and flashing and there might be a fire drill and while they're there you know even everything from the oxygen to the IV pump makes a noise I heard one little girl thought the oxygen sounded like a snake because it was hissing so you never know what a child's imagination will start doing um, and you want to keep in mind try to look at it from their perspective how scary that is Sometimes parents have to leave their child because they have to go to work or they have other children at home, and that can be really scary for the child. And then the actual medical procedures that you have to do are frightening and painful, and they're not feeling well to begin with. And so when you take all those factors together, it's no wonder that we don't always get a cooperative child when we're trying to do a procedure. They have done studies that show that up to a third of hospitalized children can suffer transient or long-term psychological reactions to what they went through in the hospital. Um, for example, I have a son who had a um, catheter, a Foley catheter inserted when he was four, and he's 16, and he still remembers <laughs> the whole incident, even what color shirt the nurse was wearing. So some common medical procedures that children might experience while being hospitalized, you know, IVs, Foley catheters, and lumbar punctures, um, anything with a needle pretty much is going to upset them. Suctioning, almost everything that you have to do as a nurse. For infants, stressors are separation from their parents, having lots of different caregivers in the room that they don't know, Seeing strange sights, sounds, and smells. They have an interrupted routine and interrupted sleep. And they may even get their nights and days confused. Oftentimes there's not a lot of light in the hospital room. It's important for infants that you keep their routine as much as possible. If they have a favorite security item, you want to ask the parents to get that if they didn't bring it with them. Let the nursing staff know uh, what the baby's schedule is. Ask the baby, the parents to remain calm. Be patient with the infant. The infant's probably going to be hard to comfort, console, or be clingy. And encourage the, pa the parent to distract, rock, or comfort the infant. Infants get stressed when they're left alone. They have to stay in a strange bed or room. The crib in a hospital looks like metal and it looks kind of like a jail cell it's not very homey um, so that's very scary looking they have a loss of comforts of their home and their family they are not around their siblings or their pets or their, their toys they're in contact with all these unfamiliar people they have painful things done to them and the medical equipment lo looks scary Toddlers, um, it's a good to be read some books about going to the hospital if you can prior to the in, uh, hospitalization if it's like for an elective procedure. You can do interactive play with dolls with toddlers. Just give them simple explanations like the doctor's going to fix your arm versus 
the doctor's going to make a cut in your arm or anesthesia is being put to sleep versus help you fall asleep during the operation and wake up afterwards. And I wouldn't even say anesthesia is being put to sleep because sometimes they think that they're going to be put to sleep and not wake up because like their dogs get put to sleep and then they never come back. So I would even say this medicine is going to help you take a nap. And when you wake up, you're going to be all better. Or And don't, don't say something like, um, well, when you get back, we're going to do a dressing change. Well, they think that you're going to change their clothes. Or we're going to take you for a CAT scan. They think there's going to be an actual feline involved there somewhere. Try to break things down into s simple explanations, but don't use words that could mean something else. Tell the truth. It will hurt, but it won't last long. Establish procedure-free zones. So their bedrooms should be a procedure-free zone. You should take a patient to the treatment room. Every pediatric unit has one to do any painful procedures. And you need to stay with the child during hospitalization or I encourage the parent to stay with the child during the hospitalization. Some stressors for a toddler are being away from school and friends. They may think they're being punished. They have loss of control. Toddlers are all about control and uh, pain. And they don't like needles or shots. And they may even be afraid that they're going to die during surgery. For school-aged children, it's great if, if for elective surgery, if the child can take a tour beforehand. Make sure a child knows why he's having surgery in words they understand. Again, you don't use words that have double meanings. Have children explain back their understanding, so ask them to state what you told them. Read books. Give as many choices as possible. Do you want a blue tourniquet or a pink tourniquet? Do you want a band a uh, Barbie Band-Aid or a butterfly Band-Aid? Explain benefits of surgery. After your, heel is, your knee is healed, you will be able to play soccer again. Ex encourage child's visits, child's friends to visit, and have someone stay with child as much as possible. Let child know it's acceptable to cry and be afraid. Now, if you have a patient that needs a procedure done, there are some restraining methods that can be used for pediatric patients. Um, first, though, you, the nurse needs to complete an assessment on the need for restraint. And you should try therapeutic holding, which we're going to go over in a minute. Last resort is restraint. You can do a mummy or a swaddle restraint, which is basically like wrapping the child up in a papoose, a jacket restraint, a limb restraint, or an elbow restraint. And I have pictures showing examples of each. I'm going to show them now. Okay, so here is a mummy restraint. This is a papoose restraint. This is the jacket restraint, restraining the child from to the bed. And here's um, bigger examples of mummy restraints. This is an example of a child that has elbow restraints on. She's obviously extremely unhappy. And this is sometimes done for like children with cleft lip or cleft palate surgery so they don't pick at their incisions. This is an excellent video on comfort positioning. It explains how to do pediatric procedures on patients in a way that is not going to cause them distress. Um, it gets the parents involved in holding them so that they're more cooperative. It's a 22-minute video, so I'm not going to play it for you, but I would encourage you to watch it. So your goal is to minimize movement and discomfort, provide an explanation and simple guidance prior to the procedure, provide analgesia and or sedation, and restrain if necessary. So I can't uh, emphasize enough that if you have time at all to put EMLA on, it's a wonderful tool in the pediatric nurse's arsenal for helping um, get a cooperative child. The EMLA cream is just um, prilocaine, lidocaine cream, and it's put on topically on a patient, and it needs to be there for an hour for it to be effective, and I think it can stay, it can stay several hours, though. 
um, on the skin. And it's used um, for painful procedures like an IV or a lumbar puncture. And it does help. Um, the longer you leave it on, the better. But it has to at least be an hour. It does not help. There's no analgesic effect or very, very minimal analgesic effect before an hour. Here's an example of comfort positioning. The father is holding the child. Um, they're starting the IV here, and they have a child life therapist trying to distract the child with some bubbles. When you're taking care of pediatric patients, you need to really be diligent with your intake and output. It is so crucial because pediatric patients are so prone to dehydration and fluid and electrolyte imbalance. And as I said earlier, just having a fever of 1 degree Celsius can increase their fluid requirement by 12%. So the doctor really needs to know what that intake and output is so he can adjust the IV rate and um, make sure the patient's staying hydrated. I actually had a patient at Walter Reed, wasn't on my shift, but the patient died. Um, it came in with gastroenteritis. Um, from the rotavirus and there was a new nurse there and a new doctor there, a new intern. The nurse did not recognize the signs uh, that the patient was being coming dehydrated um, and she did call once and told the, pa the doctor that she couldn't tell if it was stool on the patient's diaper or urine, but the doctor said he didn't want to check her I, her um, lab work or anything. So the child in the morning when the next nurse came on that was a very experienced nurse was um, close to being in a coma, and ultimately the child died. So you can, even in this day and age in America, um, a child can die from dehydration, so you need to be absolutely diligent with your intake and output. And it's really crucial that you emphasize that to your parent. Just, you know, the, the big um, plastic foam, the big foam cups, the large size, that's 480 milliliters. The smaller is 240. Um, and I always just have them write down everything on a piece of paper and a pencil. If you don't have a detailed INO sheet for them to write on. So when you're, if they're in diapers, the, w the way you get the output is to wa weigh the wet diaper and then weigh a dry diaper and take the difference between the two. Basically you want to measure any fluid that goes in and any fluid that goes out of a patient. So anything they have to drink, IV fluids, IV flush, IV antibiotics, um, oral medications, anything that goes in, and then anything that comes out, so vomit, um, large amount of sputum. If you're like suctioning someone, you should record what's in the um, suction canister. You want to record obviously their urine output, their stool output, um, how much blood you're taking from the patient, everything. And you want to make sure that the patient is has a normal urine output for age. So a patient that is a newborn should have two to three milliliters per kilogram per hour. Um, An older child, preschool age, should have 1 to 2 milliliters per kilogram per hour. And an adolescent to an adult should have half a milligram to 1 milligram per kilogram per hour. If you are having a patient that is NPO, obviously you need to always make sure that they are getting IV fluids and do mouth care for the patient diligently so that um, they don't get sores in their mouth. Once again, I'll just remind you that one gram of wet diaper weight is equal to one milliliter of urine. 
When you're selecting your IV site for a pediatric patient, you have more options than in an adult, especially if the child is not walking. So for a pediatric patient, you can, or an infant, you can start an IV in their scalp. Um, you can start an IV in their feet. You just don't want to start an IV in a lower extremity once they start walking. There are um, needleless systems and safety catheters that are widely used in pediatrics. If uh, pediatric patients are notoriously difficult to get IVs on, especially when they're dehydrated, so more intraosseous infusions becoming more and more acceptable, and that's when they, um, you know, drill a hole into the bone and set up an IV that way. And then in an emergency situation, you may even see a surgical cut down, but that's more like a trauma situation. Typically, you want to use a 24 or 22 gauge catheter in a for a peripheral IV site. This is a diagram showing the different IV sites. And um, any of these veins here for an IV um, really, you can use this too. Um, this Anna cube, the scalp veins, um, veins in the foot, even the top part of the foot, you can start an IV in. It's really important that you visualize the peripheral IV site at least every two hours. There's going to be a slide here that says every hour, but at least every two hours. And you want to document on that site every two hours. If you have a smaller pediatric patient, like a toddler or an infant, most facilities will use a buretrol or a volutrol to contain the amount of fluid that could possibly infuse. And you just want to add two hours to that volutrol or buretrol. You don't want to add more than two hours. I have seen some people leave the buretrol open so that's just defeating the purpose of the bureau trial. You're supposed to add two hours worth of fluid to the bureau trial, no more than that. And in the NICU, it's one hour. You need to use a lot more tape to secure a peripheral IV site for pediatric patients than you would for an adult. It's very common to use an arm board or a hand board. You want to make sure at all times um, just keep in mind that a pediatric patient's skin is much more fragile than an adult's. You want to have a cotton ball or a 2x2 two two underneath the actual catheter so that when you put the opsite down to secure the IV, there won't be any um, pressure areas from the IV. If you have to use an arm board, a good way to make sure that all of the tape on that patient's arm isn't causing damage is to just take a small cotton ball and um, apply it to the tape to the middle of the piece of tape and then when you secure that tape from one side of the arm board across the patient's arm to the other side of the arm board the little the piece the portion of the tape with the cotton ball will be on the top of the patient's arm and it, it's a little easier to get off but it's still nice and secured for the patient Keep in mind that complications of um, infiltration and extravasion are just as important in a pediatric patient, if not more so. And I actually had a pediatric patient at Walter Reed, again, not that I took care of, but, but came in for pyloric stenosis surgery and left without the use of their left arm. The nurse had gauze wrapped around the IV site she didn't take it off like she was supposed to. And by the end of the night, the patient's arm was black. It had, so it is not something that you mess around with. There are some local hospitals that um, do use gauze to wrap the IV site. And that's fine as long as you unwrap it at least every two hours and look at the site. Preferably, though, the use of stocking that makes visualization vis Visualization, visa. <laughs> I can't say it. It makes the site easier to visualize. How's that? <laughs>
Okay, so here's the slide that's talking about the management of peripheral IVs. You want to assess the site hourly at a minimum and document this on the flow sheet. If you didn't document it, it didn't get done. List specifically at the insertion site as well as above and below. So just because it's not infiltrating doesn't mean the site's not getting infected. And sometimes you can have the infiltration, the tissue, um, for whatever reason, the fluid goes below the IV site and you might end up with a, like their fingers all swollen. Palpate, inspect the site for puffiness, redness, skin temperature, wetness, streaking, or cording. Compare the limbs. Is there any generalized edema or is it only the limb with the IV that's edematous? What's the patient's comfort level? Is the IV site tender to the touch or is it painful? You want to remove interstitial or blocked peripheral IV cannulas. Observe the IV dressing for cleanliness and intact intactness. Do not ever reinforce a wet or soiled tape. You need to change them and ensure that the tapes in the IV board are clean. It's a terrific breeding ground for bacteria. You should absolutely never rely on your IV pump as a means of confirming the patency of your IV site. The pump can continue to infuse the IV solution into the surrounding tissues of an infiltrated IV. And finally, make sure you set your pump at appropriate limits. When discontinuing an IV, you need to ensure that the end of the line is capped in an aseptic manner. It becomes contaminated. If it becomes contaminated, discard the line. When the IV team is called in to assess an IV, saline lock the peripheral IV. Do not put on hold or turn off the infusion pump while waiting for the team to arrive. This can result in a line occlusion. So anytime that you disconnect your peripheral IV, you have to saline lock it. Use positive pressure to saline lock um, or HEP lock IVs. This portion here about HEP locking, that's not done anymore. We only use saline lock. Positive pressure is established by clamping the T-piece or catheter at the same time the saline is flushed. IV maintenance is the bedside nurse's ongoing responsibility. You should make sure that you change IV solution bags and syringes at least every 24 hours. The tubing has to be changed at a minimum of every 72 hours. <coughs> In general, IV sites are not changed unless they infiltrate or start looking infected. Okay, moving on away from IV therapy to oxygen therapy. You have already... Um, I'm sure gone over oxygen therapy, but this is a, just a short refresher. It's one of my pet peeves. Nurses never seem to know how to administer oxygen correctly. It's a huge part of your job. If you don't do it right, you can kill somebody. And um, there's really just not an excuse for not doing it correctly. When you're taking care of a pediatric patient, the flow rate, can be anywhere from half a liter to four liters per minute of for nasal cannula. In an infant, it can be as low as a quarter to two liters. Simple face mask for pediatrics is six to ten liters per minute. In infants, it's five to eight. A partial rebreather mask is ten to twelve. Um, a vent venture mask or a venturi mask, you just need to select the liter flow indicated. A non-rebreather mask is 10 to 15 liters per minute, and aerosol is 8 to 12. And we'll go with this a little more. <coughs> One thing that's not used in other populations is an oxygen tent or a hood. They're usually used in pediatrics for patients with croup, any airway inflammation, or respiratory infections. And the oxygen tent consists of a canopy that surrounds the child. Um... When using a hood, it's important to ensure that there is enough space between the curve of the hood and the child's neck to allow carbon dioxide to escape. And hood can deliver anywhere from 28 to 85 percent oxygen, depending on what you set the flow rate to be, and it's anywhere from 5 to 12 liters. I'll show you a picture here of the hood. This looks like a little astronaut helmet. 
Keep in mind when delivering oxygen in an oxygen hood that concentrations may vary even within the hood. And so you should measure the concentrations of oxygen as near to the mouth as possible. There's a little oxygen uh, measuring device that gets slid in here and put next to the patient so that you can determine um, how well the patient's doing and how much oxygen the patient's getting. For some infants and children, nasal O2 may also be needed during feedings and nursing care. You need to have the rate greater than 7 liters per minute to wash out ox carbon dioxide. Keep in mind also that a patient in an oxy hood or an oxy tent tend to get warm. So you need to make sure that you're checking their temperature frequently and if possible have them on a servo warmer like they do in the NICU so that the heat can um, the heater can regulate the temperature for the for you. This is a patient in a tent, an oxygen tent. A simple mask is used for patients who require a moderate flow rate for a short period of time. Keep in mind you always need to have the flow rate on a mask at least 6 liters. From 6 to 10 liters you cannot ever, ever, ever have a mask less than 6 liters. If you do, you might as well be putting a bag over your patient's head. This is an infant with a nasal cannula. And um, we already talked about the flow rates for nasal cannula. This is information from your ATI, and it's the nasal cannula guide here from 1 to 6 liters is for an adult. The information I provided you on the pediatric population was from the American Academy of Respiratory Therapists and that was accurate. I just wanted to show you this picture here when you're applying nasal cannula to an infant or a young child you want to always make sure you have some cushioning um, where the tubing meets the patient's face. So I like to use Obsite and then secure the nasal cannula to the op site if you don't have you know something specially made for the nasal cannula. This is an oxygen concentrator and it allows you to adjust the percent oxygen that you're giving to your patient. So although the flow rate may be high, say you want to give your patient 5% um, or excuse me, 5 liters, you can do 5 liters but only 60% oxygen instead of 100%. So you would use that in mostly neonatal populations where you have a risk of if there's too much oxygen delivered, you can give your patient retinopathy of prematuria, prematurity, which is actually why Stevie Wonder is blind. Uh, he got too much oxygen, he was born premature. Or, um, Sometimes in like another pediatric population that you have to be careful with giving too much oxygen would be a patient with cystic fibrosis. Pediatric patients with cystic fibrosis act a lot like an adult patient with COPD. Non-rebreather mask, um, you need to make sure that you're doing 10 to 15 liters per minute. Again, if you are not, the carbon dioxide is not getting flushed out of the mask and you are hurting your patient, not helping them. The benefit of the non-rebreather is it can go up to 95% of pure oxygen. Um, I did have a video I wanted you to watch on the non-rebreather. Oh, okay, here it is. What's important to remember with the non-rebreather is there's a little port. This is our uh, adult total non-rebreather mask, our number 2102. You'll notice that it has a side valve on each side as well as inside there's a valve. So a total of three valves makes it a, clo a closed 
breathing oxygen mask. So you set your oxygen flow from 10 to 15 liters per minute, fill up the oxygen bag by simply holding down the, the valve till the bag is full. You place the oxygen mask on the patient's face and put the strap to hold it in place. That's our adult total number breather. The next mask is simply having one valve removed so that you have an open air for room air as well as a closed valve for when the patient breathes. This is our 2101 adult partial non-rebreather mask. Again, there's a valve inside the mask, one on the outside, and an open valve so that if you ran out of oxygen, the patient wouldn't suffocate. This is an ideal mask for the EMS fire emergency services market where you don't always have 100% oxygen availability. Yeah, um, so I, what I wanted to emphasize with that non-rebreather mask, I'm sorry, my mom's here. She was just mentioning how my grandmother said that she had a cloth palette because she moved a piano when she was four months pregnant. Um, so when you're using the non-rebreather mask, you need to make sure that you push down on that valve in the middle of the mask and that um, if you hold down on that, the bag will inflate. If you don't pull apart the bag and hold down on that valve, it won't inflate properly and you're not using a non-rebreather mask, you're just using a simple mask. Okay, um, just keep in mind again that oxygen is a drug and you need to treat it as such. You need to be very careful about following the physician's order. This is not something that you can kind of fudge and do what you think is best. No, you have to follow the physician's order very closely with oxygen therapy. Make sure your patient's on a pulse ox and um, this end tidal carbon dioxide monitoring is for a ventilated patient, which we're not going to really talk about. And patients um, on oxygen obviously need to be on a continuous pulse ox. When you are taking care of a pediatric patient, the pulse ox needs to be changed from site to from one site to another at least every shift. If you're taking care of an infant with a pulse oximeter, it should be changed at least every four hours. And in the NICU, they change it every two hours. Keep in mind there are different sizes for endotracheal intubation in pediatric populations. Endotracheal tubes are uncuffed for children younger than eight years except in special circumstances. When suctioning infants and children, Make sure that you are using a catheter size appropriate. You want to use uh, anywhere from 5 French to a, in an infant to up to 14 French in an adolescent. To avoid the total airway occlusion, your catheter size should always, always be approximately half the inner diameter of your trach tube. And you need to keep in mind that appropriate suctioning pressures in children are not appropriate suctioning pressures in adults. If you use an adult suction on a neonate, you could give them a neurothorax and cause their lung to collapse. So you always want to use appropriate suction. Make sure you look at that suction on the wall before you do anything. Neonates and infants, 60 to 80. Children, 80 to 100. Adolescents, 80 to 120. When you are suctioning a patient or a pediatric patient. Okay. It's really important that you pre-oxygenate that child before and after suctioning. You need to have the child on a pulse ox and you should always stop the procedure if the child falls below parameters, which the, is generally 90%. Um, in older children, make sure you don't insert the catheter further than three to five inches. 
In infants and young children, it's 1 to 0.6 to 3 inches. The rule of thumb is to insert your catheter the distance from the tip of the nose to the angle of the mandible. It's a general rule of thumb. Okay. <laughs> a feeding tube of 5 French to 10 French is used in infants, and the size increases proportionately for older children. Selecting the smallest diameter tube possible for the infusion and a tube of soft material always decreases the child's discomfort. Um, when you're doing nasal tracheal um, suctioning, you want to... <laughs> <laughs> Always make sure that um, you're, yeah, I already said this, three to five and a half inches and uncuffed tube size. So when you need to um, figure out what size ET tube to use, the general rule of thumb is the age divided by four plus four. So if you have a patient that's four years old, it's four divided by four, which is one plus four, which is five. <coughs> That's for an uncuffed tube. A cuffed tube is different, but remember, you hardly ever were going to use a cuffed tube under the age of eight. And we already went over this in the first pediatric boot camp, but... I'm not going to read this slide to you, but you should be aware that pharmacokinetics in children are a lot different than pharmacokinetics in adults. Their absorption from their GI tract is affected by gastric acid secretion, bile salt formation, gastric emptying time, intestinal motility, their bowel length and effective absorptive service, and microbial floral. And all of these things are reduced in neonates. And all may be reduced or increased in an ill child or an age of any age. Reduced gastric secretion also makes bioavailability of some acid labile drugs like penicillin and will decrease the availability of weakly acidic drugs like phenobarbital. And Reduced to gastric emptying and intestinal motility increases the time it takes to reach therapeutic concentrations. Also, drug metabolism and elimination vary with age and depend on the substrate or the drug. But most drugs, most notab notably dilantin, barbiturates, analgesics, and cardiac glycosides have half-lives that are two to three times longer in a neonate than in an adult. Keep in mind also that plasma protein binding, renal blood flow, GFR, and tubular secretion in the kidneys are all altered in the first two years of life. My son cleaned his room. I'm very proud of him. Injected drugs are often erratically absorbed because of variability in their chemical characteristics. And there's differences in the absorption of IM drugs by the site of the injection, their variability in muscle mass among children, illness, and the variability in depth of the injection if it's too deep or too shallow. The truth is that standardized dose ranges have not really been established for most pediatric drugs, for most drugs in children, that children do respond differently to medications than adults, and you also must, as a pediatric nurse, incorporate principles of growth and development when administering medications, and your margin of safety is very narrow. When you're medicating to 
of the infant. It's great if you can cuddle and comfort them as you're medicating. Toddlers use play, minimize restraint, and give praise and stickers as rewards. If I can, I ask the parent to administer the medication after I've checked it and checked the patient. Preschoolers offer them a choice. Do you want apple juice with your medicine or do you want grape juice? school aid children also provide them choices, explanations, distraction, and support. And for adolescents, explain and allow participation in the decisions, praise their cooperation, and provide an outlet for their frustrations. Always make sure that you're calculating in kilograms. If you mistakenly have a patient, um, for example, I, this happened once at uh, where I worked, I had a patient that um, the admitting nurse entered the weight in pounds instead of kilograms. She forgot to convert the pound into kilograms. So we were giving the appropriate dose based on the weight in the computer, and pharmacy was sending up the appropriate dose based on the weight in the computer, but we were all giving 2.2 times more than we should have for a week. And by the time the error was noted, the patient had kidney damage and was deaf from gentamicin. So you need to always double check not just that the weight, the medication is appropriate for the weight per kilo, but also is that weight in kilos really correct? If you're looking at an infant and it says that the infant is 10 kilos and the patient looks like they're 5 pounds or 10, 10 you know, 10 pounds, something's wrong. So always look and double check. Is that weight that's in the com computer logical? Does it seem like it could be true? Because it might not be. Other than that, medication administration should be identical. You have the six R's that you have for administering medication to an adult. Same routes of administration. Here is one option of giving a medication to an infant. You can use a dropper, especially if it tastes good. They'll often be cooperative. And you want to um, apply that medication to the side of their mouth. This is a pacifier that has a reservoir here for medication. And the patient sucks on the... Um, nipple for the pacifier and then the medication is given that way. Some hospitals do use those. If the patient is not cooperative, you're going to have to swaddle the patient, um, sometimes sit on the patient, use a syringe um, with the medication in it, and push down on the patient's tongue uh, while slowly giving the medication on the side of their mouth. But hopefully, you're going to have a patient that's going to be cooperative. Just remember that the side of the needle is going to be uh, no, no bigger than one inch um, in a newborn to infant. And it should be five eighths of an inch in a preemie or a newborn. You want to have a 23 to 25 gauge needle. In toddlers, you can use a one to one and a quarter inch needle for the thigh or smaller needle for the deltoid and so forth. This site here is the only only site appropriate for an infant, the vastus lateralis. Also keep in mind when you're giving octic medications to an infant or a young child three or years or younger, you have to pull the penna, this part of the earlobe, back and down. Whereas in a child over the age of three, you pull the penna up and back. So back and down, and as you get older, it's up and back. This is a diagram showing um, why there's such different pharmacokinetics in children. It sh really should have been a few slides back. I apologize. This is a diagram for Foley uh, insertion. And just to make you aware, 
that the appropriate size for pediatrics is not the appropriate size for an adult. You have typically a six or even a four French for a newborn, an eight French for a younger child, and a ten French for a school age child. And then you get into 12 um, or 14 French for adolescents. If you use a catheter that's an inappropriate size, you can damage your th their urethra. So you need to make sure that you're considering that catheter size when you are going to do a Foley catheterization. This is a tape that's sometimes used in the ER in an emergency situation. It gives the physician a general idea of what their weight in pounds is. They line up the tape next to the patient and there's a measurement that gives them, um, as I said, helps them approximate their weight. That is the end of your pediatric boot camp. I think that I've covered everything I thought you absolutely needed to know. I could probably make this three hours longer and it would be enough, but if you have any questions on any of the material that you I've covered or you've heard, please let me know. Um, and I will see you in Morgantown on Friday.